Next on Quest. Travel to California's Mojave Desert, where construction of the world's largest solar thermal farm is pitting renewable energy against threatened tortoises. Then to Ohio to investigate the complexities surrounding the controversial practice of fracking. And in Missouri, join up with college students as they compete to build state-of-the-art homes. One, two, three, go. Powered entirely by the sun. Quest, America's energy future. Major funding for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation. Our ability to harness energy allows us to do astonishing things. Jetting from one continent to another, keeping our homes warm through sub-zero winters, powering our cities around the clock. But our main sources of energy are still petroleum, coal, and natural gas. And with global energy consumption predicted to increase 56% by 2040, the continued use of non-renewable fossil fuels comes at a great cost to the environment and to our health. I'm Simran Sethi, and in this episode of Quest, we meet innovators who are tackling these challenges and reshaping the energy landscape. We go first to California's Mojave Desert, where a massive solar farm is feeding the power grid with clean, renewable energy. What's that sort of shiny object off in, in the distance there over a sea of mirrors? That's the first thing you see, the, the towers from over the mountains, and as you get a little closer, you begin to see a sense of the scale of uh, how it's designed. Three giant towers and 300,000 mirrors have gone up in California's Mojave Desert, one hour south of Las Vegas. The $2.2 billion Ivanpah Solar Project is the largest of its kind in the world. It will be able to produce as much electricity as a medium-sized natural gas plant, but without the carbon emissions. We selected the Ivanpah site because it had good sun. The better the sun, the more cost-effective the energy is delivered because you can produce more. Within 200 miles or less of Los Angeles, we have one of the very finest solar resources on the planet. You know, we need to take the carbon out of the world's largest economy and do it in a very short time frame. I mean, Large-scale solar in the best locations, like the desert, are going to be important parts of that. Ivanpah is one of seven new big solar plants in the state that will be finished by 2014. And solar energy from plants and rooftops will continue to grow. California utilities are rushing to fulfill a state law that requires them to produce one-third of their electricity from renewable energy by 2020. California was among the very first states to adopt a policy that required utilities to buy a certain percentage of their electricity from renewable energy sources. Now 34 states have adopted similar policies Unlike the photovoltaic solar panels you find on rooftops and in some solar plants, Ivanpah uses a technology called concentrating solar thermal. Mirrors reflect sunlight and concentrate it onto boilers filled with water on top of three towers, each as tall as a 45-story building. The taller the towers, the more mirrors fit on the field. The boiler produces high-pressure steam that powers a turbine at the base of the tower. Just as at any traditional power plant, the turbine produces electricity. The project itself uh, will, on an annual basis, serve the equivalent of about 140,000 homes. One of the shortcomings of solar energy is that it's only available when the sun is shining. But systems in place at some solar plants similar to Ivanpah get around this by storing heat in molten salt for later use. 
When you add storage, you're essentially making this a power plant just like a natural gas plant, meaning it has the ability to be flexible, controllable, and deliver power when it's most valued and most needed onto the grid. Ivanpah doesn't include storage, but the first U.S. solar plant with storage started delivering electricity in 2013 in Arizona. Despite the advantages of these large solar plants in the desert, Ivanpah ran into challenges. From the get-go, we knew that the Ivanpah project was located in, in an area that had fairly high density of desert tortoise in it. Worried about habitat disruption, the Center for Biological Diversity out of Los Angeles testified against the project. But construction began in 2010. Desert tortoises are protected under the Endangered Species Act, so the project's developer, BrightSource, based in Oakland, California, asked for a permit to move any tortoises it found on the federal land where it was building the plant. The initial surveys did not show that there were a lot of desert tortoises. Surveys conducted during dry years led BrightSource to believe they'd find close to 30 tortoises. But the rains came and 173 tortoises showed up instead. We stopped construction in one area of the project. Um, what they did is have us take a pause in, in the area in which they had located the additional tortoises. The company transferred the tortoises to pens and later moved them back onto wild land. 53 additional tortoises have been born in captivity. If you take into account the care and monitoring of all the tortoises involved in the program, it works out to be about $55,000 per tortoise. I think early on it was a big rush to get projects on the ground. There hadn't been any planning. There hadn't been any large-scale evaluation of the landscape. In response, more research is taking place and new policies are being adopted. Biologists like Ken Newseer from the U.S. Geological Survey are trying to better understand how development might impact animals like desert tortoises. Each tortoise has its own channel, and we plug that channel in. So that tortoise is up in this hillside somewhere. The U.S. Interior Department has identified solar energy zones on public land in six southwestern states. These 300,000 acres are close to transmission lines and have fewer threatened species. In California, government agencies and environmental groups are working to identify large tracts in the Mojave Desert suitable for wind and solar plants. This plan would also set aside land for desert species. We're engaged in that process and very much looking forward to help crafting a good plan that allows for renewable energy development as well as allowing for good, strong conservation to occur. So this one here is a new borough. We just put an address here so we can see not only how many times does he use this same exact place, but which other tortoises are using this place. I got a position, here we go, 665, 672. Around the country, developers, policymakers, and environmentalists are faced with the delicate task of balancing the need for clean energy with the need to protect well-loved landscapes. There's no such thing as an impact-free energy source. If we're gonna deal with climate change, we have to understand that. And if we can choose the locations for these facilities very carefully, we can avoid a lot of the biggest problems. While renewable energy sources are going mainstream, fossil fuels are still projected to be the dominant source of world energy over the next few decades. America is now poised to become the world's top producer of oil and natural gas. And while this may decrease our energy dependence on other nations, it will increase threats to our environment. In Ohio, Quest investigates the environmental challenges of tapping into the vast oil and gas reserves embedded deep within the Earth's crust.
On February 19, 2013, nearly 100 protesters stormed a hydraulic fracturing waste storage site in New Matamoros, Ohio. The group responsible was protesting what they call the, quote, storage and dumping of hydraulic fracturing waste in Ohio. Waste that they claim contains toxic chemicals and radioactive material. The dumping that they refer to is in part the use of injection wells to dispose of the wastewater byproduct of hydraulic fracturing, often called fracking. Dumping has the connotation of irresponsible, uncontrolled release into the environment or discharge into the environment. That's the opposite of injection. We require injection in order to prevent dumping. Scott Kell is a geologist at the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, the government body responsible for permitting and regulating injection wells for Ohio's oil and gas industry. According to him, hydraulic fracturing has a long history and little risk. Hydraulic fracturing has been practiced in this country since 1948. And this many years later, 60 years later, we're still looking for our first documented example of a contaminated water supply. So the outcry seems to be disproportionate with the, with the reality here. But opponents of hydraulic fracturing argue that contamination often goes undocumented. One thing that both sides agree on is that the general public knows very little about what this drilling procedure actually entails. Hydraulic fracturing emerged in response to our demand for affordable domestic energy, particularly natural gas and oil, which generated over 25% of electricity in the U.S. in 2011. In energy-rich sections of the U.S., an estimated 35,000 fracking wells are positioned over underground gas or oil-bearing rock layers called shale basins. Energy companies drill deep underground, sometimes as far as two miles. Then the drill turns and moves horizontally. The drill is removed and the well is lined with multiple layers of steel casing and cement to prevent any fluids from leaking out. A perforating tool then creates small holes in the cement casing at the shale layer, and a secret cocktail consisting of sand, water, and a small amount of chemicals is shot down the well. The mixture hits and fractures the rock, releasing the oil and gas trapped within it. Depending on the length of the particular well, this process can use anywhere from 2 to 10 million gallons of water, and 20 to 30 percent of that water returns to the surface, along with fluids from the shale, sometimes called brine or salty water. You've got a lot of things that are pretty nasty in that water, and they're not things that you would ever want to just have released into the environment. Dr. Julie Wetherington Rice has been researching and writing about the oil and gas industry since the mid-1980s. You start getting all of the, um, the salts that come back up. It's sodium chloride, calcium chloride, all the salts that are associated with seawater. But this is really concentrated seawater and you get the radioactive metals coming back. According to Scott Kell, these wastewaters can contain radiation, but he claims the levels in Ohio-produced waters have never been high enough to be harmful. But he says regardless, they must be carefully managed. There's two primary ways that that waste stream is managed. Uh, one of those is underground injection for the purpose of disposal. The product comes in via truck. Our operators go out and they hook the truck up and they offload that product into a holding tank. Um, it's not as difficult as what you think it is. John Jack is the Appalachian Region Vice President of Development for Green Hunter Water, a disposal well, brine trucking, and water recycling company with operations in southeastern Ohio. We operate seven disposal wells in West Virginia and Ohio. These underground wells are classified by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as Class II injection wells, designated for oil and gas wastewater. Underground, they look similar to hydraulic fracturing wells, and in fact, many of them are repurposed oil and gas wells. And beneath the layers of steel and cement is a steel and rubber device called a packer, which provides an airtight seal preventing any fluids from rising back to the surface. 
The brine water is then pumped into a sandstone layer with impermeable rock forming a barrier to prevent leakage to other layers. And what happens below ground is monitored by a pressure gauge above. We should be concerned about them because a lot of them are pretty old. And there is a track record of leaks at these facilities. But the track record of injection wells is yet another point of contention. We have injected nearly 300 million barrels, and yet we have not identified a single public or domestic water supply that has been contaminated by the subsurface injection of those waste and the return of that waste back to surface. Concerns have also been raised around the high number of injection wells in Ohio, approximately 200, compared to neighboring states like Pennsylvania and West Virginia. We seem to be permitting them a whole lot faster than US EPA does, and I'm not sure why that is the case. Ohio does not have magic geology that can swallow everything. Without many injection wells, states like Pennsylvania and West Virginia transport much of their wastewater to Ohio. In fact, out-of-state waste accounts for over half the fluids that are disposed of in Ohio. The market controls the need for injection wells, and the reality is, is that uh, from the inception of the program in the early 1980s to present, the Ohio injection industry has always been able to manage the volumes of produced water that are generated. But activists are demanding more regulation. And in 2012, when an earthquake in Youngstown, Ohio, was linked to a nearby injection well, it added fuel to the fire. But there's another way to handle fracking wastewater that avoids problems like earthquakes and injection well leakage, and even addresses hydraulic fracturing's thirst for large amounts of fresh water. The way the industry needs to be going is reusing of this product. We would like to clean that product and offer it back for reuse at drilling locations. It goes through our water treatment process, and what it is, it's a vibrational separation system, which takes almost all the suspended solids out. Dr. Wetherington Rice believes that wastewater recycling programs are the way to go, but thinks they don't go far enough. We actually do not need injection wells. We can recycle or repurpose all of the various waters that comes out of an oil and gas well. Energy and disposal companies are increasingly investing in recycling technology. Both sides of the fracking debate agree that recycling wastewater makes sense, at least for the short term. As far as the long term is concerned, questions and debates will persist around the value of extracting non-renewable fuel resources to feed our growing need for power. Nearly 40% of America's energy consumption occurs in homes and commercial structures. Fortunately, engineers and architects all over the globe are designing new, highly efficient buildings and affordable household tools that help reduce energy waste. In this next story, we meet students at the University of Missouri who are at the forefront of this initiative, building a home that is not only energy efficient, but energy independent. Imagine a self-sustaining home for the future that exists today. That's the challenge for 19 college teams from around the globe vying to win the Solar Decathlon, a competition sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy I don't know how far that is. to encourage design and technologies for homes that are energy efficient, economical, appealing, and powered entirely by the sun. Most homes generate power through fossil fuels, which impacts the environment. But solar houses use clean, renewable energy that save residents money. For two years, students from the Missouri University of Science and Technology have been designing a solar home called the Chameleon House. It features a web-based automation system that updates the home's heating and cooling systems with changing weather. 60 architectural and engineering students are designing the home from the ground up. It's a hands-on process. I'm an architectural engineer, which means that I have learned a lot about the design process of a building, but now we're actually constructing a building. I knew almost nothing about solar homes before joining the team. This is amazing. I'm 21 years old and I'm building a house that I helped design. 
the Chameleon House is being built almost entirely by students, guided by a few professionals. And adding to that challenge is a time factor. I learned a lot myself today. We have four months left to build this home, and it's something that is definitely really exciting and really scary. Each solar decathlon team is restricted to a floor plan of just 1,000 square feet. The challenge is to pack energy savings into every square foot. So now we are just looking to which ships go where on the house. So the Missouri team is using custom prefabricated walls called SIPs, structurally insulated panels. Here we have a structurally insulated panel. Um, it's two pieces of plywood filled in with styrofoam in the middle. But the reason why these are so good at thermally insulating the house is because there's no wooden beams that go from this piece of plywood to the other. These kind of panels are um, designed to be uh, sturdy in earthquake kind of areas as well. Okay. The SIP walls replace standard wood studded walls padded with fiberglass insulation. In just three days, the Chameleon House walls and roof are nailed into place with a modular construction design to ship the house cross country for the solar decathlon. Today, the Chameleon House is becoming energy independent. We're putting up the actual panels and the inverters and get all of that set up so we can be able to wire it up and have it generate electricity for us. There we go. That consists of 21 410 watt panels. And then on the front of the house, we'll have an overhang with what's called a bifacial panel. And it'll generate 1.9 kilowatts. So we'll have a total of 10.5 kilowatts on the house. Basically, the house will be net zero, and that means it'll produce as much electricity as it uses over a year's period of time. The Missouri team has competed in four of the five previous solar decathlons. And the homes they built are now joined side by side in a model solar village. The homes are off the public power grid, self-powered by solar energy they generate and share through a connected microgrid. Several of the homes are occupied by Chameleon House team members. I've lived in this house for about a year now. It does have the elongation east to west as all of the solar houses do, and that's to um, get the most out of the south facing sun, and so you get the most sunlight in the front windows, and you can get the best cross breeze with that as well. It does have uh, an induction cooktop, and so that uses magnets with the pot, and so it actually heats the pot itself instead of the whole space of the cooktop, and that's a little more efficient than a traditional cooktop. I don't think that there's a lot of difference in your lifestyle. Maybe I won't turn on the air conditioning, maybe I'll just open the windows. If it doesn't impede in your lifestyle at all. Missouri's decathlon team gathers data based on Caitlin's home, and the other solar village homes. We can actually track their energy usage. We are also able to use, use their knowledge of the homes in building our new home. The heart of the Chameleon House is a home automation system. In traditional home, you may have a smart thermostat that helps with mitigate some of the power consumption of a heating and cooling system. In the Chameleon House, what our goal is to do is take that to the next level. The Chameleon Home Automation System is designed to take real live feeds from a web-based interface that will then read what your current temperature is within your house, but also the temperature and settings outside of your house. It can then make changes to the heating system and the cooling system within the house, which are smaller than a normal heating or cooling system would do in the house, which reduces the power consumption of the system by a, a significant amount. So not only can it control the actual heating and cooling system itself, such as your AC union, it can also control opening the shades um, to gain heat from light or opening clear story windows to let out extra heat instead of using the actual typical AC unit within the house. Another energy saving factor is radiant heating built into the home's flooring. Instead of heating a house traditionally with the air vents, it actually has tubes that run through the floor. And so that's where the hot water runs through and it heats the house from the ground up. Just as the chameleon house has taken final shape, a day of reckoning has arrived. 
Finally, after two years of design and five months of construction, we're actually gonna take apart our house uh, to ship it off to California. We just split our house apart by three feet. It will take five days for the Chameleon House to be trucked to Irvine, California. A solar village of 19 homes is forming at the Solar Decathlon competition grounds. Each team has just nine days to get their house in working order for the competition. As the competition opens, each house is evaluated on 10 factors to determine the home's energy efficiency, affordability, and design. But the big draw is educating the public about the efficiency of solar energy. There's a real desire amongst people to understand the technology and learn about it. I think most uh, homeowners will agree that energy efficiency, which saves them money, is always, uh, you know, the bottom line is what they're interested in. And these solar decathlon houses are some of the most efficient houses around today. Win or lose, the decathlon prepares students to be future energy leaders and their innovations to become essential designs for home builders around the world. Major funding for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation.